Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is John McIntosh. I'm with uh, the Cafe Scientifique Silicon Valley. And uh, um, as we do every month, uh, there's a couple housekeeping bits. One is to see who's here for the first time at, uh, at the Science Cafe. So about maybe 10%, 5% if we're lucky. We've seen over the last uh, six years that um, the, uh, we get more and more regulars, which I, I guess you'd expect. Uh, this is a the the end of our 2012 calendar. We are now putting some time and effort into building out 2013, and we're always looking for recommendations, either for topics or specific speakers. Um, as you as you see something that you think would be interesting to to, to haul up here in front of the cafe, uh, feel free to send me your ideas and thoughts uh, to. Most probably most people get my emails, uh, and you can just respond to those, and they'll come directly to me. The other uh, part of housekeeping is to uh, just give a big thank you to SRI, who opens up the conference center to the to the Science Cafe, and really makes it uh, possible to to do this. They've brewed countless gallons of coffee over the past five years. I think we've been meeting in the space now. This is we're heading into our sixth year at SRI, and so it's been a, an incredibly good run. Uh, so for uh, so tonight, we have uh, Dr. Yarnall, who is ad addressing a topic that I've been seeing a lot of thinking about. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of talk in some spaces about the, the higher education bubble and university education and inefficiencies that are built into that. And so um, somebody who's doing research on just innovation in higher education and um, how to assess that is it's, it's very timely. Uh, and the, one other interesting thing to point out, I don't know if she'll get to it, but if after this to continue the education and dialogue, she's got a blog called Envisioning Student Learning. So if you Google that around, you, we can continue to bug her long after this event <laughs> is over. So without any further ado for, uh, discussion from me, I'll turn this over. Thank you. Thank you, John. <laughs> Hello, I'm Louise Yarnall. And I'm really excited to be speaking to you tonight about some work I've been doing with my colleagues here at SRI for four years. And as you can see, we're talking about using cognitive science, so my background is psychology, to transform assessment in college general education. So um, let's get started. First, I want to just acknowledge my wonderful colleagues, without whom I could not have done this. Um, and also the funder, the U.S. Department of Education. But I particularly want to mention Geneva Hartle, who is my mentor and really one of my closest friends. And she is also the in-house assessment guru here at SRI. And Larry Gallagher, who is also a co-PI, and he is an amazing statistician. And uh, so I want to just call them out. And you can see all the names of all my other terrific colleagues up there. And we also worked. How many people here are um, faculty who worked at a community college at some point or at a four-year university? OK, good. Welcome. We did uh, consult, I'd say, about a, maybe 20 different four-year faculty and a couple dozen uh, community college faculty in this work. And it was really very rewarding to interact with, with those faculty. So, and I'm looking forward to the Q&A and the conversation and the feedback. So here's the big picture of what I'm going to be doing. We're going to give you a little background about who I am and uh, where I work, uh, very little. And then I'm going to frame the need for this research. Uh, I'm going to take some time on that. And I'm going to talk a little bit about our approach and then I'm going to talk very briefly about what I think some of the benefits are. And then you guys can tell me later. And what I'd like to do is um, there is a lot I'm trying to cover. I'm going to try to be really staying at a high level. But to keep the flow, I'd actually really like to just kind of get it done and then have the uh, questions and the comments, if that's OK. If you really feel like there's a burning question, then please just raise your hand like that, and, and we, can, can, we can talk. Um, anyway, then I'll talk about the findings, um, and, and then I'll talk about our next steps, and we'll do the Q&A. So first of all, Center for Technology and Learning is a division here at SRI. 
and there were about 81 researchers and support staff. Um, basically, we are people who work in education research. We focus a lot on evaluation, assessment design, instructional materials design, often using technology, but not all the time. And um, most of our work is not the kind of work that you're going to see in the news. When you see the news covering education, it often is really what I call the business of education. It's the equity issues. It's the politics of education. Really, the consumers for our kind of research tend to be people behind the scenes in education. So it's the people who make the materials. It's the people who design the textbooks, the people who design the tests. Um, so you're going to get a peek in the next hour into what happens behind that curtain. So I wanted to start off with why is it important to think about assessment in college? And why are you all here on a nice evening uh, to even think about this? And here is my framing of, of uh, the issue. There is a gap, I think, often between what college professors say they want students to learn and then how they actually test. And the tests, I'm going to just put it out there, mainly address what is important for school learning. I mean, they're, they're definitely tracking the students you know, to move on into the major. But they make a trade-off. And the trade-off is they do not test what the professors actually will tell you they value the most, which is not um, how much have you memorized, right? It's how well can you take what I've taught you and use it in your real life, OK? So the big trade-off on assessment, I'm going to argue here and see if I can convince you, is that they make this kind of sad trade-off. So what we wanted to do was, what if you could create a test that could do it all? It'd be easy to score. It's important for future learning. That is, you can still cover the bases. But it's also going to give your students some practice in applying what you're teaching to real world problems. Now, to just frame the context, we weren't just creating tests for everything under the sun. We were creating tests for a couple of subjects. And now I'm going to sort of tell you why we focused on the subjects that we decided to uh, focus on. And I'll go ahead and read this quote aloud while you read along. And this comes from a New York Times columnist, Tom Friedman, and his professor colleague, Michael Mandelbaum, and the book that they published, I believe it was last year, That Used to Be Us. Have any, has anybody read that book besides me? <laughs> OK, there are a few of you. So basically, what the book does is it sort of sets up an argument for what our big challenges are as a nation in the next generation. And this really, this statement encapsulates it. Over the last 20 years, we as a country have failed to address some of our biggest problems, particularly education, deficits and debt, and energy and climate change. And now, they have worsened to a point where they cannot be ignored, but they also cannot be effectively addressed without collective action and collective sacrifice. OK. So I want to talk about, uh, my, my point is, I don't think common sense, with all due respect to Tom Paine, is going to really work with our citizens for the future. They need to know to address some of these problems in climate change, and deficit and debt, they're going to have to know some stuff. They're going to have to know a little bit about economics. They're going to have to know a little bit about biology and life science and the carbon cycle, for example. And they're going to have to know it as a scientist or as you know, a bio an economist knows it, with some level of expertise to really make a contribution. So that's my position on this. So the next question I ask is, well, how well is college preparing citizens to solve these kinds of problems. So the first place you might want to look is, well, how many people actually major in these subjects? And I have a quick question before we look at these percentages. How many, what do you think is the percentage of Americans with college degrees? 37 percent. OK, 30%. You're right. You're right in the ballpark. It's really about 27.5%. So 
So when you look at these percentages, keep in mind that only a quarter, roughly, of the nation actually gets a college degree. And of those, 16% will get science, technology, engineering, and mathematics degrees. About 5 to 7% will get biology degrees. And 0.7% will actually go forward and major in economics and get a degree. So the point I'm trying to make is, if we really want to make a difference in terms of preparing people to contribute as citizens to these problems, the action is probably not with the majors. I mean, the majors are going to be experts, and they're going to do tremendous work. But I'm talking about the citizens and how we all can be on the page to help. So let's look at the non-majors. And the good news here is that a lot of people pass through biology classes and economics classes in college. And there's sort of a bad news story here if you're interested in getting a lot of people to major in these subjects. Because just looking at the biology numbers there, 45% of the people who state at the beginning of college at a four-year university, I'm going to major in biology, 45% will change their mind. In community college, 69%. When do they change their mind? The data tell us that they take two courses in biology, they get a C average, and they check out. So the good news is that's a lot of people <laughs> who have at least been exposed to two courses in biology. Um, same thing with economics. Uh, one of the biggest majors in the nation is business. And on the road to business, often people have to take an economics course or two. So 40% of college students will take an economics course. So let's now talk about how well are non-majors learning the ideas from these two subject areas so they can be, you know, solve problems or contribute. So the story in economics is it's about half. I, this came from a study, there really isn't a lot of data on this, but in a study in 1980 looked at, it was an interesting study, how, what was the difference in how people understood economics and did well on a test before they took college economics, after they took the basic courses, and five years after graduation. And really what the half of the pie signifies is they have about half that sticks after five years. So that might not sound great. But actually, it's a lot better than what's going on in biology. This is sort of the state of mind of a biology non-major. This is somebody who takes a couple of courses and gets a C. They have a couple of, a few things they kind of get, but they don't really know how it all fits together. And they sure as heck can't use any of that to reason through anything, OK? So um, what, why is it so hard? to learn these subjects. So first, let's look at the problem in economics. Now, some of you may recognize from the Mary Tyler Moore show the anchorman Ted Baxter. And uh, what was his primary sort of characteristic? He was a bit bumbling, bumbling but confident. <laughs> he was very confident. and. Um, so when you're an economics professor, you're essentially facing a room full of Ted Baxters. Most of the students in that classroom pretty much think they know economics. They're listening to you talk, and they're thinking, yeah, I got this. You know, I've been buying stuff. I've been reading the newspaper all my life or listening to the news. I've got it. Well, in fact, they really don't. And one of these phenomena with economics is that first midterm when so many students flunk. So, the solution that economics professors have developed is, you know what, we need to test them earlier. We need to test them often. We need them to, maybe not to get a grade, but just to confront them with the reality and to humble them into studying. And that's actually having some success. The situation in biology is almost the complete opposite. The students are scared. They're overwhelmed. There's way too much information coming at them in those first two years of biology. And so again, how do the biology professors say we can deal with this? Um, essentially, they haven't really decided. Um, they think, well, maybe we just have to build their confidence. That's one idea. Another idea is, 
well, maybe we have to prune back the amount of information that we're spraying at them. Uh, but how would we do that? Everything's so important. So, you know, some are saying just focus on the chemistry. And others um, have other ideas. But they're really um, talking about misconceptions sometimes. Let's confront their misconceptions. It's an open question in biology how to solve this problem. So this leads us to the need for and the approach for our research. So in a nutshell, I want to find some ways to ensure that more non-majors are learning the big ideas in economics and biology and how to apply them in real life. And the approach I'm taking to this is not so much to focus on instruction, right? That's very important, and that's part of the, the mix, but also to focus on the tests. Because the tests are basically, I'm going to argue, that's a signal to the student of what you value. And the, those are the goalposts on the field. So we're going to talk about what we did to design this. So first of all, just to orient you, this um, graphic here, you can see on the vertical axis, we, we went and looked at well, what tests are out there right now published by the publishing companies for college and measuring what students are learning in college. And on the vertical axis there, there's a whole set of tests that look at your critical thinking ability. And they don't really have anything to do with what you know about the domain. It's just, can you think critically? So there are a bunch of tests like that. Then there's this other set of tests on the horizontal axis that really look at how much have you retained from college? How much do you know? But there's this, uh, I would argue that a lot of those tests, and you're going to see in the evidence that I share with you, are about how much you can recall. And they're not about how you reason using the ideas in a subject. So the white space, the place we wanted to focus on, was that very issue. You've learned the principles of a domain. Now can you apply them? Do you know how to do it? So um, why is that important? Well, our ultimate goal is to get more folks to think, I'm using the word, like an expert. You know, um, cognitive science tells us that it takes an awful long time to become an expert. I mean, basically it takes 10 years almost every day interacting with a domain to become an expert. That's unrealistic for most of us. So what we're trying to do is actually accelerate that in some respect. And it, what is really fascinating to me and was fascinating to me when I went into grad school about cognitive science is the following. There's a lot of work happening behind the scenes where if you study what experts know, if you actually kind of map out how they organize knowledge in a domain, you can take that and present that to novices. And it becomes a template for their learning. And it becomes much more efficient. And so I love this idea. And this idea definitely informed the design of our, our assessment. So now, in the next couple of slides, I'm going to share some test items that come from the test that we developed. And I'm going to, they differ in some really fundamental ways. And this is an opportunity for a little audience participation. And what I'm trying to get you to understand here is how you answer them. I want you to think as you try to answer these how it feels when you're answering them. And then you're going to start to see how the way you ask the question really makes a difference to how you learn and what you learn. 